this afternoon. So good to be in the house of the Lord. The presence of the Lord was so heavy in the morning service. It's an awesome service. And I know God's going to move here again today. Let's give him our best. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your power and your might, Lord, your mercy and your love, Lord. Lord, the power you give us, Lord, over serpents, Lord, over the enemy, Lord Jesus, in that name, that name of Jesus. We lift it up most high here this afternoon, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to have your perfect will and way here today, Lord, as we give you our best, Lord, in worship and praise. Lord, we ask you, Lord, to fill this house with your presence. Lord, send ministering angels among us, Lord, we pray. Lord, we see how we most here this morning, this afternoon. Touch the hearts and minds of those that are here. Oh and we give God. you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mighty is our God. Mighty is our King. Mighty is our Lord. Ruler of everything, oh glory, glory to our God, glory to our King, glory to our Lord, ruler of everything, His name is higher, higher than any other name, His power is greater, for He has
going to miss Brother Marvin. Miss seeing his face down there. You know, and he was at the end time Bible studies on Tuesday night. The doors are open. Brother Marvin is there, man. I'm going to miss seeing him. Thankful for the time I can have with him. Amen. Lord. New souls for the harvest. God, there's a harvest out there. Take everything we receive. Share. Share. Don't keep it to ourselves. The word that we hear, you know, that, that when we read the word and God gives us a revelation, share that with somebody. Especially an unbeliever. We have to do that to reach the lost. It may be those few words, you know, but it's going to be, that's what God demands to do. God preach this gospel. Amen. Let's pray for the service. Pastor brings forth the word. Pray for one another. Unity. God brings his church together. Amen. You know, we have some that are missing sickness and other reasons. God's going to bring this church back together. Amen. 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 Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Yes. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all you've done, Lord. Calvary, Lord, where you brought each one, every one of us from, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your power, your might, your mercy, and your love. We thank you, Lord. Lord, for the move you had this morning in the morning service, and we believe you're going to do the same here this afternoon. We believe that your will will be done, Lord, in our lives, Lord, as this word comes forth. We ask you, Lord, for your anointing touch on our shepherd, Lord. But Lord, our hearts and minds and ears to receive this word. Lord, all those sick and afflicted. Brother Marvin, Lord Jesus, Lord, we call him home, Lord. Thankful for the time we have with him. Thankful for the example he set before us, Lord. We lift that family up to you. We ask you to strengthen them, Lord, in the days to come, Lord. Touch this church, Lord, his church family, Lord. Strengthen us, Lord. We're going to miss that, brother, Lord. You have such an impact on us. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for all you've done. Thank you for this day. And we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, you can return to your seats. But please remain standing as we receive this afternoon's tithes and offering. I need one more. Brother Keith, you grab one another. This is Missions Sunday. This is the first Sunday in the month is, is set aside for missions. Remember those. You know you know the battle that the church is facing in the U.S. right now. You know, the, the government's taking advantage of this pandemic and how you know, they're putting all these uh, restraints on the church. Think about these missionaries all around the world. You know, they, they put their lives on the line. God told them to go. God's with them. But dangerous areas, and they're trying to preach this gospel. They're reaching people all over. They laid it all down, jobs, careers, left family. They just went where God told them to go. We're thankful for them. Remember them. Let's lift our hands and ask the Lord to lay out our hearts He wants us to give. And listen, trust in Him and step out in faith. Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your love and your presence that we feel here this afternoon. We ask you, Lord. To lay in our hearts this day what you want us to give. Lord, we're so thankful, Lord, for those you called, Lord, halfway around the globe, Lord Jesus, Lord, in the dangerous territory, Lord, that we know you are with them, Lord. Thankful, Lord, that those that answer the call, Lord, to take this gospel to those that never heard it, Lord. We know they're reaching lives. We know there's a harvest out there, Lord. So thankful, Lord. We just ask you, Lord, to lay in our hearts what you want us to give, and we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can come and march, Brother Brad's in the back. We give electronic. offer. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, once again for this day. Calvary, Lord, where you brought us from. Lord, we lift this offering up to you. We ask you to bless it, Lord. Multiply it, Lord, like the fishes and the loaves far beyond these walls. Lord, we're so thankful, Lord, to be able to get back to your kingdom, Lord. Lord, we know you have a purpose and a plan for this church, Lord Jesus. Lord, we're just being thankful that we're able to give back. Lord, we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Because of who you are, I give you glory. Because of who you are, I give you praise. Because of who you are, I will live my voice and say, Lord, I worship you. Because
11 to 12 is going to be the viewing, and at noon is going to be this actual service right here on Friday. preaching years ago at a French church. And they had a little rinky-dink pulpit and had a pole on that wide and went down. And I was preaching my heart out. And I got down there walking around a little bit and I look over there and I left. And there's a pastor's wife just laughing. So, I didn't think nothing of it. People, they mess around church all the time. So I look over to the right and I'm preaching. And there's a lady over there laughing. And I look back to the left, and she's almost in stitches. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me. Said, Check your fly. <laughs> it wasn't hot with it that day. So I know what to do. I made a few jokes about it. I just kept on preaching. So needless to say, I feel really insecure if there's not a big bullet in there. Uh, yeah, you, you develop all kinds of habits if you preach the pastor a long time. Anyway, uh, I was thinking when Brother Carter called me this week, it was just seven days ago that Brother Marvin come right up here and our evangelist laid his hands on him and he prayed. I watched him as he wept and he prayed in the spirit. And only God would know that the Lord was going to take him home that week. Uh, and uh, I know that you all brought him into your home to care for him. And the Lord knew all of that so he wouldn't be alone. God is just so, he's so merciful in so many small ways that we don't see and understand. And uh, I thank the Lord his mercy yes. and somebody else I'm going to tell you ladies something somebody made a comment uh, in Jefferson this morning and they said, uh, they said you know he couldn't even really see that day because of some a surgery or something on his eyes and uh, as if he came to church how many people use such little excuses right. not to be in the house of God right. 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 Yeah, he, could, he, he could barely see and they had a Walk him in. Amen. Walk him to the seat. Walk him to the front and back. But he was here. Right. And, uh, right. Right. God just has a way of honoring uh, our faithfulness. Amen. 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 I was reading. Well, let's have Brother Jerome pray. We're just gonna. I've got some text for you. We're just gonna kind of really see where it's where it, where it ends up. Switch it, please. Lord, we pray in the service, God, that you would have your little way. Lord, that you would use Pastor today for each one that you give to give to the people today. Lord, help us keep our ears open and our spirit open to take this word in, God. And not leave it here, but Lord, be able to take it home and, and apply it to our lives daily. Lord, we pray, God, that's all in your mighty name. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I preached the first nine verses of this text this morning. I would like to preach the last um, seven or eight verses here this evening or this afternoon. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to open up to Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 10. I am going to read the Amplified Version here, uh, simply because it just makes it a little more clearer to the ear.
Solomon says, So then I have seen the way to bury him. Those who used to go in and out of the holy place, but they never escaped their doom. And they are soon forgotten in the city where they did such things. This too is utility, or as he would say, vanity, or emptiness. Because the sentence against an evil act is not executed quickly, the hearts of the sons of men are fully set to do evil. Very simply put, that means because we do not immediately feel the repercussions of our decisions. We tend to just live as if there will never be any form of repercussions. He calls it evil. The hearts of sons of men are fully said to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his life seemingly is prolonged in spite of that wickedness, still I know that it will be well with those who reverently fear God, who fear and worship Him openly. And in quotations, it writes, realizing His omnipresence and His power. And I'll make some sense of this in a few moments. But it will not be well for the evil man nor will he lengthen his days like a shadow because he does not fear God. Now, just hold on with me here. You always got to let me finish. I asked the lady this morning. She's supposed to be back in church this morning. I texted her. I said, hey, you weren't in church. And you told me you'd be back. And she said, did I? I said, yeah, you did. Oh, I said, well, did you listen? Well, yeah, I got to the part where you talking about wanting to go to the Washington D.C. with a, with, with and have a, and have a big march on the city, and then it cut out. I said, "Well, my God, that was the bad stuff. You didn't finish with the good stuff. You got to finish." So, you, what I'm saying is, let me get to the end. This text, um, really, the the essence of the entire passage, and it's important to, to emphasize this again, is vanity. Everything is vanity. It's what Solomon says. And and it, really, it is. Everything is vanity. You know, uh, the way we dress, the way we do our hair, you know, uh, the time we spend getting ourselves ready, the cars that we drive, the way we decorate. It really, in essence, is all vanity. It doesn't make it all wrong. It doesn't make it all evil. But it's, it's, it's meaningless. Right. You know, when God calls us home, it's not going to matter. Nothing else is going to matter. Yeah. And we, we can say that a thousand times, but because judgment is prolonged. The hearts of men are set to do evil. And so because those things aren't in front of us, it just seems like it's so hard for us to be able to really comprehend. And I don't know how other people uh, think or act. I'm a gloom and doom person. My wife tells me sometimes, and sometimes I probably do put that, that, that uh, image off. But to me, reality is reality. And this life is not reality. And, and, and the things that we even have to deal with on a regular basis is not reality. Yeah. You, know, you know, your bad day is not reality. Uh, you know, whatever troubles you're having with your car today, that's not reality. These are just little speed bumps in the journey on our way to reality. That's right. yeah. that's right. Reality is, 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 is what's set in heaven. Reality yeah. is eternity. Right. And... Yeah. Um, to me, there's nothing. Someone told my wife this week, they said, well, you know, this virus is real. And I said, I'd, I'd have said eternity is real. You know, I know the virus is real. But I'm not going to let people forget that eternity is real. I'm not going to let people think that this thing should supersede where God wants us and how what God would have us to do. And and, 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 and and cause us to forget about, about heaven and about eternity. And so there's, there's a multitude of things that are being uh, addressed here in this scripture. First talks what I would call those who uh, basically do not treat the house of God with reverence or respect as far as their way of living, their righteousness, their lifestyle. 
They come into church. You, you know these people. You'll be able to identify. And they come, and then they you go out there, and the, and the world, they're just different people. You know, they're not the same. Uh, I was talking about a gentleman I know uh, from the Andover area, and he's uh, he's supposed to be some type of assistant pastor. And I use that word lightly because he doesn't doesn't deserve the title, but he has a mouth literally like a sailor. And when I say, you know, he would make you blush with his f words, but yet he'll stand behind the pulpit and he'll preach, and it's it's very quite atrocious uh, to say the least. Um, you know, and, and I'm bringing all of this up for reasons. So you just got to kind of hang tight with me. And, you know, somebody that wants to serve God and someone that's trying their hardest to serve God, yeah. oftentimes you can just look and you can just think, my Lord, Jesus, the system is not fair. Yeah. How many times have you compared yourself to people out there in the world and you think, well, you know, how come people in the world always seem like they're doing so good? You know, and, and, and they don't seem to have any struggles. And how come they always seem like, like they're being blessed and, and they're prospering? And, you know, I, I don't get me off on a tangent because the whole, you know, blessing thing is so, it's so perverted and so polluted. It's become so carnal. You know, I mean, I mean it, 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 God, could, God could give you a mistress and you'd call it a blessing. Really, I mean, it's, it's really that bad. People call about anything a blessing. As long as it appeases the flesh, it's a blessing. And um, Solomon is, is addressing these things. And I read this morning in chapter 4 as well. Really, if you don't, if you don't spend any time in Ecclesiastes, you really should spend a lot of time in it. It's really, it's really a fascinating book. And in chapter 4, he begins that he talks about... Uh, uh, he is taking he has taken notice of all of the oppression that goes on in the world and the oppression of of the little guy if you please and how the masters of those with authority have abused that authority and and so now we come to this place and it's almost as if Solomon is trying to encourage those that are, are trying to be good honest sincere people who we'll call them Christians just for the sake of this argument really wasn't a thing, such thing as Christian back then. And so that's why he, he writes in verse 11, because sentence against an evil act is, is not executed quickly. The hearts of the sons of men are fully set to do evil. But what he doesn't write, he doesn't write how you and I view those things. And oftentimes we allow ourselves to get distracted by the people who are who are living foolishly, or the people who are not acting morally, or the people who are not living godly. And we allow those things to distract us and to frustrate us. And in many cases, some people get frustrated to the point where they get frustrated against God because somebody else in the world that's not even living right seems like they're doing just fine. But but the sentence against an evil act is not executed quickly. Why do I say that? I know we do not like to hear that our reward is in eternity, but that is something that we must keep our hearts set upon. It doesn't satisfy the flesh immediately. It doesn't do anything for me right now. But... But, but but if I can just keep my eyes fixated on why I'm here. Excuse me. It's not Corona. I just swallowed something the wrong way. Don't worry. Don't panic. I don't want you running for the door. I could use a bottle of water, though. Please. Um. You know, sometimes... Now, I don't know about you folks. I, I try to be honest. Um, I, I'm not one of those people that has crosses hanging all over my walls and pictures of Jesus swinging from my, my rear view mirror. That's just not me. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying it's not me. What I'm saying is, you know, I probably have a few more carnal things hanging on my wall. <laughs> you know, not bad. But, you know, maybe a, a picture of a barn or something. Or, you know, those things I find a little more enjoyable. You know, I, I, this is not a bad thing, and please don't take it the wrong way. But I don't walk around the mall with my Bible and, 
Hey, Jesus is coming soon. I'm not saying it's wrong. That's just not me. And here, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make a point. My point is, I'm a little human sometimes. Sometimes I act like the person that I am, which is a human being. And, and sometimes I don't always feel so, so spiritual. I, I don't always feel like, you know, bless the Lord, oh my soul. I can't sing. I already know all that. No, sometimes I'm, I'm looking for some old carnal song that will appease the flesh for a few minutes because I just don't want to be spiritual today. Anybody else ever feel that way? Thank you. I got a couple of honest people here today. And in those moments and in those days, sometimes I even tell myself, you know what, maybe it is a little better out there. Maybe it's not as frustrating out there. But then, somehow or another, in God's mercy and His grace, He brings me and He captivates me. He brings me back to reality. And He reminds me not only where I came from, and not only where He brought me from and what He has done over the duration of my life, but that He reminds me where I am going in Him and what God has laid up in heaven for those that love Him and those that will be faithful to Him. He reminds me of those things. church is going to become more isolated. I really believe that Christians are going to be looked more at as kooks and quooks and quacks and whatever whatever else you might want to label us. And so I want to tell you something. If there's one thing that you've got to do, you have got to bring yourself to the place where you just don't care what people think about you. Not that I don't, not, not that I walk around like an arrogant fool. And, 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 and I'm, I'm acting arrogant and someone says I act arrogant. I don't care what you say. I'm not talking about that. Oh. I'm, I'm saying you think, you think I'm reckless because I keep the doors of the church open. That's fine. No problem. You're welcome to have your opinion. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you're reckless because Walmart's open. I think you're reckless there because you go. Go. Oh, church yeah. club's open. I think you're yeah. reckless because, you know, I can go on and on and on. But what I'm saying is, is because... We, I believe the church will become more and more isolated. There's a couple of things that are important. And the first one is we have got to become closer together as, a, as, as brothers and sisters in the Lord. We cannot allow ourselves to become more distant. You might think what you want, but I think social distancing is of the devil. I think he wants to keep people away from each other. I'm not saying, hold on a second. I'm not saying that we should not be cautious and careful. But what I am telling you, what man had, may have intended for good, the devil is using it for his kingdom. And he's using it to separate the body of Christ. But this is the hour where we have to draw closer together because we will be more separate than we have ever been. There won't be an option to come out of the world because the world is going to reject everything that's true and right and godly, no matter what it is. And so you got to get content, you know, being a Paul. You have to, you have to be content being a light show. You got to be content being a Jesus. We don't do this thing for popularity. We have got to remind ourselves. We don't do this thing because we want to be politically correct. We do this thing because A, we want to please God. And B, we want to be with him through eternity. And that's why we've got to keep our focus. So we, 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 we need to remind ourselves that there are things that is not acceptable to the Lord. And, and, and Solomon, in my opinion, is drawing a very nice distinction here. Now let's read on in verse 14. He says, there is a meaningless and futile thing which is done on the earth. That is, there are righteous men who gain it. 
whose gain is as though they were evil. And there are evil men whose gain is as though they were righteous. Very simply meaning, sometimes it seems like no matter how hard you want to serve God, nothing good comes out of it. And then you look at your neighbor, and, and, and he's the biggest heathen on the face of the earth, and, and he just hit the lottery for $20 million. And you're like, what's up with that, God? Then I commended pleasure and enjoyment because a man without God has no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry. For this will stand by him in his toil through the days of his life which God has given him under the sun. I think about this text a lot. Uh, not, not because of the text, just because of the way I am. Uh, I was listening to somebody, I don't remember who it was. I, I, I listen to so much stuff and talk to so many people. And someone was just saying how, you know, I get off of work at four and, and when I get home, I got, I got really nothing to do. So I'll, you know, I do, I walk the dog and, and I'm thinking, man, I don't know what it's like not to have anything to do. I don't know what it's like to be able to sit before 9.30 at night. I, I, I don't know what it's like. Just, well, what am I going to do? Oh, you know, let's go to walk the dog. Maybe we'll go to the gym for four hours and work out. I'm like, I'm, I'm struggling to get 30 minutes of the treadmill in every other day. And you're at the gym every day for three hours? That's nice. But you see, that's the difference between somebody who's trying to give their life to the Lord and somebody who isn't. Listen, you might not have all the luxuries of people out there in the world, and you might not drive a car as nice as somebody else who's not even trying to serve God. And it might seem like everything's going well for them, and you're just scraping for pennies. But that's because of who you are, and because you make decisions in your life that put first the kingdom of God in your life. And that's your desire. And you might not prosper the way someone else might, but that cannot be the thing that drives us. Because that's not why we're here. And that's not what we're in this thing for. A man without God is no better thing under the sun other than to eat and drink and be merry. Now, I'll be honest with you, there are times that does sound good. I'm just being honest with you. Then something inside of you says, That's not who I am. Right. Right. This right. is who I am. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Lord. One day it was popular to be a pastor or a preacher. Now it's not at all. Yeah. One day it was popular to be a Christian. You were you were you were smiled upon. Now you're frowned upon. You know what you are? You're a religious zealot. That's what you are. You're somebody who doesn't have compassion on anybody. You're somebody who judges everybody. About you do that you're better than everybody, you're holier than them. See, some some people get rattled by those accusations, but you have got to bring yourself to a place in your walk with God where it doesn't rattle you one bit. Because you know who you are, and you know your love for people, and you know your love for the gospel, and you know your love for the Lord, and you know that I'm not judging, I don't want to see you go to hell. That's why I say what I say. It's not because
cannot discover the work that is done under the sun. Well, let me explain that to you. You can certainly understand this, Pastor Gardner. Others of you will certainly understand what I'm about to say. But I can hold more days thinking, what am I doing? I am not the right guy for this job. I don't, I feel like we should be a whole lot farther along than what we are. I feel like this or that, thus or thus. But Solomon reminds us, he says, I applied my mind to know wisdom and to see the activities of mankind that take place upon the earth. While some man seemed to sleep neither day nor night, I saw all the work of God. I concluded that man cannot discover the work that is done under the sun. You'll never know the full impact of your Christianity or your ministry. You'll never see all the people that have been touched. You'll never see half the lives that are serving God today because of your boldness and because you choose to stand strong. You'll never know what somebody has done in their life or how it has changed them because of the life that you live. You'll never see half the work that is done under the sun. We'll never fully, uh, I know oftentimes we feel like what we're doing doesn't matter. And because we don't see the fruits, because the spiritual fruits that come from our lifestyles or from our ministries can never be fully viewed through the eyes of man. They cannot. Because what, what we do is we're laying treasures up in heaven by the life that we're living and the people that we touch. And if nothing else, if you never touch the soul, the fact that you choose to walk through this life and you I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Like a tree that's planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. Hey, what about this? No, nope, can't do it. Hey, I'm what's wrong with that? No, I won't be moved. You gotta do this. You gotta go to two services. You gotta go to three. Does it really matter? You gotta go to prayer. I shall not be moved. Like a what it requires, whatever God asks of you, and you'll never see the fruits of all that. You may never understand the extent. I wish somebody would hear what I'm trying to say to you this morning. You'll never, never understand the extent of your impact. We'll never see the full fruition of, 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 of our decisions. I firmly believe that should the Lord tarry, but that does not mean that you have not impacted the world by your lifestyle. By your choices, by your decision to serve the Lord. That does not mean that there are not people that will be forever impacted and forever changed because you choose to be a child of God. There will be people that will reject you. People will turn away from you. People will, will uh, despise you. People will hate you because of it. But I'm here to tell you today, just keep on keeping on. I'm here to tell you, don't compare yourself to people in this world. Don't look 
telling you what it appears they might have or don't have. I'm here to remind you that God takes note of everything in heaven. He writes every deed down. He knows every sacrifice. He knows every act of humility. He knows everything that you have done and you have labored in love and you're laboring the kingdom of God. He knows the pain that you have borne just trying to be who God has called you to be. takes you up and sets you on a pinnacle and he begins to let you see some things from a distance and I don't know if you understand what I'm saying to you you might but sometimes you got to pull yourself back in order to understand and it's not that we want accolades it's not that we that we need someone to pat us on the back but sometimes we just want to know what we're doing is having a little bit of an effect on somebody Sometimes we want to know there's just a purpose to it, that we're not just wasting our time or God's time, that we want to use our time to the best uh, that God would have us to use it. But sometimes you have to ask the Lord to take you up on a pinnacle and set your feet up on a rock somewhere high and look down and see the life that you have lived, the legacy that you have left for people in your family, in your home. And there may be people you have prayed for and you have remained and it seems like it's all for naught. But I'm going to tell you, you might be gone in any eternity, but they might be praying through then. Something finally somewhere will settle in. And they'll say she stayed faithful until the very end. She stayed faithful to the house of God. She's always in church lifting her hands. She's always there. It doesn't matter what was going on. I'm telling you, we'll never see the full fruits of what it is that we're trying to leave in this world. The more ungodly this world becomes, the easier it might be for us to question who we are and what we're doing. But I'm telling you today in the Holy Ghost, you be proud of the person that you have tried to be. Be proud of all the little things that you have given up. Be proud of the changes in your life that you have made. Be proud that you have fought when you've had to fight your own self sometimes to get yourself into the house of God. Be proud of when the day you made the decision for God to let him fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And be proud of the day that you went down that watery grave. It's something that most people will say doesn't matter. That's no big deal. It matters to me. It matters in eternity. Because I made a decision. I consciously made a choice. I went down in that watery grave and I came up as the Lord released me from some things. I think as people get older, and I'm, I'm finishing, as you get older, you begin to reflect more and you have more regrets. But sometimes you're just going to have to remember person that you were and the person that you are. When you don't feel like you've made a difference, when you don't feel like there's any, anything to show, when you feel like you failed God, I really, truly, with all of my heart, I want to remind you today that the fact that you stood, the Bible says when you've done all that you can do, just stand. Just stand. Sometimes the decision not to lay down and give up is the most powerful decision you'll ever make in your life. The decision just to keep on keeping on. Keep on persevering. 
Keep on giving God your best. God, it felt like I failed you today. But you're here. God, I felt like I failed you this week, but you're back. God, I didn't do so well. Tomorrow you can do better. The world might not let you get away with any little mistake. But they're there to, my God, they'll, 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 I mean, you just slip up one little, and then they're on it, man. They're on like white on rice. Do you know why they're on it? You ever wondered why? I'll tell you why. It's because they hold you in such high esteem. More than you'll ever know. They look to you to be a strength to them, even if they never tell you. They look at you as a standout, as somebody who's different from the rest of the world. Hey, if nobody ever questions you about the lifestyle you're living, you probably ain't living right. If they don't ever get a little frustrated at you because you slip up, don't, don't, don't be angry. Remind yourself next time, that's how they view me. They view me as somebody who doesn't make mistakes, and so they're surprised. Surprise. <laughs> a lady, I'm done. We were, we were at a Christmas banquet just many, many years ago, probably, I don't know, 15 years ago, 16 years ago. And we had all these people lined up, and um, we do it a little different now. They, they do an amazing job, and they, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, they got an awesome theme. For January for our, our end of the year banquets. I hope you'll plan to attend. That's going to be fun. And so I sit down beside this lady. I'm just sitting there. And I, I just start stuffing my face, you know. I mean, when food comes, I mean, I don't know if you all want to be proper or not, but I'm eating. I'm hungry. And she's sitting there and she's like, she's looking at me and I'm like, what? I'm like, when I'm eating or something? She goes, no, I just, you know, I can't believe, you know, the, the, the pastor's sitting beside me. Okay. I mean, to me, I'm just like, I'm like a flunky still trying to understand why I'm even pastoring a church. I was then and I still am now. And, and she goes, do you even sin? <laughs> now, I should have let my wife answer that question. I've had people ask me that question more than once. You know why? It's not because I'm perfect. God knows that one. It's because they look at me and they hold me in high esteem because I've tried to live a good life. I've tried to give God everything that I can give him. And in my eyes, I'll leave this earth feeling like I failed. But in God's eyes, in the legacy that we leave, that will not be the case. Thank you, Lord. So I want you to stay with me, if you would, please. I didn't give you a title because I didn't have one. All I had was a scripture. And what I felt in my spirit. And I want to tell you today, I want to tell somebody, God wants somebody to know, don't you be dismayed. Don't you feel like a failure. Don't you feel like you've not contributed anything. Don't you feel like there's not much you've left behind? Because I'm here to tell you there's a world of remaining steadfast. There's a lifetime of resolute decisions. A lifetime of pushing yourself into the prayer room when your flesh didn't want to be there. A lifetime of fasting when you really wanted to eat. But you said to yourself, I've got to, I've got to push, I've got to persevere, I've got to to get a hold of God. I need to hear from the Lord. Ups and downs and good and bad and joyous times. Times where you just shouted for joy at the altar and then there were times where you just wept under the weight of the things that you are wrestling with in this world where God just said, just leave it here and give it to me and let me take it from you. Even for the season. Don't worry about those folks that seem like they're just always getting ahead. Seems like you got to not serve God to get ahead. I got news for you. The devil will give you anything that will keep you away from God. A lot of things those people have called blessings were from the devil. Because if they pull you away from God, it's not of God. Never will be and never has been.
So I have come to tell you the Lord honors you today. God sees. He sees everything. He sees what you have given. He sees your love and your passion for the gospel. All that journey has been riddled with mistakes and hiccups and failures and faults. But ultimately, I'm still here. You're still here. Many are not. And don't worry about being rewarded in this life. Your reward's coming. Our good friend Mervyn, today, he's enjoying that which he heard preached his whole life. Think about it. Our, we can't even really wrap our minds around that. It is so amazing that we really, you know, we can we can think and we can all feel the good and all that, but that doesn't even come close to what the promises. I has not seen, nor he heard how great these things are that I know prepare for you. So why don't you do me a favor today? Why don't you one more time give God everything you have in worship? Give him everything you've got in praise. If you need to repent of something, then repent with everything that you've got. If you need to just cry out to God and lay some things down, just do it one more time. You're one step closer. If you just want to rejoice and celebrate and thank the Lord for his goodness, then do that. But just give him your all. Give him your all. Invest your all one more time, even if you're tired, even if you're weary. You might be able to see in your body. That's okay, just let it go. Hallelujah. 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 We exalt.
Thank you, Lord. But it sums up by saying this. It was David. And, and David, as was preached, looked around and he saw the prosperity of the wicked. He saw how well they were doing. And then he compared himself. I'm trying to serve God and do the right thing. And the wicked ones are really prospering. And then the Bible says his feet nine near slipped. He almost said it's not worth it. But the Bible says until, until, he, until he did exactly what you're doing right now. Until he went to church. Until he came into the sanctuary and saw the latter end of the wicked. Our end is better than their end. Our end is better than their end. As we end it with the Lord. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for the word of God. Lord, let it continue to have a place in our hearts and in our lives. Help it to conform our image, Lord, to your image. Our thinking to your thinking. Our action to that which is pleasing in your sight. And we will give you all the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise in Jesus' name. Let everyone say with uplifted hands. Amen. Amen. Be each other in the Lord.